I'm uh, Jake Crejean. Um I used to go to school here. Um, they're not sure exactly what my handicap is, and I'm blind. My center vision is gone. I have purple, but my center vision is gone. So that's my starter. Okay. That's good. Yeah. My name is Mike Cooper, and I've been a person with a disability for 40 years this past July 4th. So I'm always the dinosaur in the room. Uh, I'm at a stage now where I, I, uh, I talk to friends that are still in the disability movement, as, uh, as it's become to, uh, to be known. And uh, it's, it's interesting, to, in any movement, if you were there for some of the, the origins of it, and you live long enough, you outlive the competition to where all of a sudden you become an expert in the field. So I'm enjoying that part now just because I've spanned enough time that nobody can check my work anyway if they go back 40 years. <laughs> so I had the opportunity to do a workshop in Grand Rapids this past October for the Michigan Rehabilitation Association that looked at four decades of my experience. So it was really a great opportunity because I could slant it any way I want and uh, remembered the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and, and now into the, the double digits to look at how attitudes have changed and just where we've, we've come from. So I always feel like the dinosaur in the room when I have a chance to do this. So I'll give some, some input as we go along. No. Uh, my name is Noah Brewster. Uh, I've only been in a wheelchair for four years. I can't imagine 40 years. It seems like it's been... A decade already. Uh, flies by. It does, yeah. <laughs> when you're having fun. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I jumped into a swimming pool August of 2007, and I broke two vertebrae in my neck. I believe that's how you were injured? Water swimming skiing, actually. Water skiing. Same, pretty much the same injury. I was yeah. just moving faster. Yeah. Um, I barely, barely hit my head, but when I did, it just... It tweaked my neck just right. I broke C6 and C7. Um, it's been a challenge. I spent three months in the hospital, a uh, year and a half in rehab, and it's been rough, but I'm glad I'm still here, finishing up my degree in criminal justice through Fair State, trying to move forward. That's all I can do. I'm Nancy Hartshorn. I teach psychology here at Delta. I'm, I, I'm not a person with a disability, but I have a son who's 22 years old who has severe disabilities. He has something called charge syndrome, and his major disabilities is that he's deaf and blind. Um, he has some usable vision, which he uses really well. Uh, his behaviors are kind of autistic-like, which is very typical of someone who's, who's deaf-blind because they're, you have to bring everything right to them. Um, can't, you can't if you're not in their communication bubble where they can see and hear you, then they miss out on everything. So they spend a lot of time kind of in their own little world. Um, he also has balance problems and eating issues. Right now we're dealing with kind of going back in time. When he was two years old, he got a, a feeding tube in his stomach. We spent a long time trying to get his swallow safe enough to be able to feed him orally. We've been feeding him orally for about eight years, took the G-tube out of his stomach about six years ago, um, and two weeks ago he failed his swallow study. So he's been eating. Now all of a sudden he's aspirating everything he eats again. So we're working on therapy. If it doesn't work, we may have to take a step backward and go back to the G-tube, which would be awful for many reasons. Yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. Um, but I guess what my point there is that I guess raising a child with a developmental disability from the beginning who has he has really significant educational needs, significant communication needs, physical, medical needs, he's had like 32 surgeries, is for a parent a marathon. You have to, you have to stagger your energy because if you blow it all at the beginning, you're going to be tired. <laughs> you have to, you know, just when you think things are going well with my son, like I said, you take three steps backward. And it'll be that way for the rest of his and my life, probably. So it's uh, he's an absolute joy to me. I don't want to paint the picture that it's a big downer because it's not. He's just an amazing kid, and I'll give you more details, I guess, as we go through. Great. Thank you. Does anybody have a question they want to start off with? Or? 
start off, we'll eventually start on one side of the room and work around. Uh, um, I might start then with a, a question to um, to Jay. Jay, can you tell us a little bit more about your um, how you found out about your condition? Because you weren't born in a wheelchair, is that correct? Uh, no, that to hurt my arm. <laughs> 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 but um, no, I uh, like crawled until I was like uh, five, and my mom kind of didn't think that was right, so she went and got me looked at. I mean, I got looked at before then, but nothing like really alarm didn't make alarms go off. So, um, but I got looked at when I was five. Well, I got put in a chair when I was five and I've been going back and forth to Ann Arbor since I was like five to fifth or birth to fifteen but you know I really started pinpointing it between five and fifteen and the reason why fifteen was my shut off date was because I got tired of going because you could go down there and um they test you like a guinea pig because they wouldn't know what's the matter with you. And I got tired of being poked in pride and so I quit going because they couldn't figure out anything and I wanted to uh, enjoy life, you know, and not just lay around and get poked, you know. So um, I quit going. Um, so basically um, I've went through life not knowing what I have. Nobody knows what I have. And then um, they tell me, um, I don't know if you guys are good with your abbreviations, but um, they tell me I got cerebral palsy, and muscular dystrophy, mod prosclerosis, and possibly polio, but they tell me I'm too young for that. And then in 03, October 4th of 03, I lost my center vision and again went down Ann Arbor and they had no reason for it besides um, all they could tell me was my center nerves died so you know and I'm like what do you mean and they're like well like positive and negative so I'm looking as my negative died so I got my positive I mean you're, you're gonna find out through today that I have a very loose vocabulary and way of thinking and all that, so I don't want to offend anybody today either. So, Mike, tell us a little bit more about the services here at Delta and your role that you play in this um, It's interesting. I mean, if if you look at um, this is going to sound like lecture time, but if you really look at the population. I mean, that's that's what I've really known. Grown. I mean, when I went back to CMU after my accident back in 1972, I was the only wheelchair user in the university, other than an instructor of psychology. So I, I feel like a dinosaur that way because it wasn't typical to have a significant disability like mine and just go back to go to college or go back to college. And my naivete really paid off. I mean, I was 24 years old when I got hurt. I was your 60s uh, late bloomer who had a lot of other things he'd rather do besides take school seriously. So, I mean, I had just come back from backpacking around Europe for five months and late bloomer. So anyway, I, I was very naive about it. I, it never occurred to me not to go back to college. I mean, I just had one year left to a, with a teaching degree. I thought, well... Even as little as I knew about my disability, I thought, well, I can sit behind a desk as well as stand next to it. I didn't see anything in that profession, really, that popped up as a major obstacle, as long as I could get in and out of the building. So it wasn't, it wasn't one of those real big forks in the road in terms of career. I could still see myself teaching. So I just assumed I'd go back to, to uh, CMU. But now I look back at it and talk about naive because now think about it from a legal aspect. That was 1972. That was a year before the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was even passed that even got the attention of communities and colleges and businesses about non-discrimination against people with disabilities. 
CMU wasn't mandated to take me back in any way. So it was really one of those people being with people, which has always been my attitude about it. We can have all the laws you want, but if people aren't sitting down and talking about it and figuring out how to get through it, it's not going to work. You can add any law that you want. Any, any group along the diversity spectrum has gone through that. The law is one thing. There's a letter of the law and there's a spirit of the law. And if you're not talking spirit, you're going to do bare minimum, what, what's the, the least you have to do to comply, that kind of thing. That still happens today. And it, it still happens. Forty years later, it's still happening, but not to the degree that it, that it was happening then. <coughs> so if it wouldn't have been for housing people and administrators and instructors sitting down going, geez, Cooper, how are we going to do this? I wouldn't have been successful, and I've tried to never forget that part of it. So now, 40 years later, the estimate is that 67% of students in high school coming out with a disability and wanting to go on to higher education are selecting community colleges, 67%. So community colleges across the country have really had to look at those kinds of growth figures and say, how can we provide a level playing field to students coming out of high school that want to go to Delta College? So that's kind of my job. I work with the administrators and faculty and staff to say, what can we provide here that's going to be open door enough to students that they feel they can come here and take the same, not only the same opportunities as any other student, but the same risks uh, you know, the same scary uh, adventures that other students have in terms of being successful. So it's a small office within other offices, certainly. I'm, I'm located in the, in the counseling and advising office. But that I liked. I've been here seven years, and I've worked with Delta a lot over the last 25 years um, when I was with an agency in Saginaw, but it was more the barrier-free design. And... I certainly wasn't in the beginnings of that, but I take great pride in it because we had uh, the Office of Civil Rights come in here four summers ago, and we were listed as probably one of the, the most barrier-free campuses on, in the country in terms of community colleges. It's nice to be in flat middle Michigan, isn't it? Right away. You know, we're off to a good start anyway. <laughs> and then, uh, but it's been the spirit of the law instead of the, the letter of the law. The letter, let me give you just one example. The letter of the law would be choosing maybe at two ends of the college um, restrooms to make barrier free. And everything else would amount to signage directing people like Jake and Noah and myself to where those barrier free bathrooms are. Instead, you go around Delta and every restroom is barrier free. And every restroom even has a power door operator, which isn't one of the requirements, you know, for basic compliance. So that's the spirit of the law. And I've always appreciated that philosophy. And it's one that, well, gee, if one restroom's good, then why don't we make them all that way? Same thing with parking. I get complaints all the time because we all run out of parking spots, believe me. <laughs> but we've got 54 additional parking spots than what the requirements would be for, for compliance. So we've looked at, I think, uh, along the way, every, every aspect of it, so that students that want to come here, no matter the disability, have equal opportunity. And that's, that's the whole gist of it. Great. Who's got a question? Mike, because I work here, I'm just wondering, what projects do you have in, in progress uh, to, to uh, help handicapped uh, mm -hmm. students have a better experience here at Delta? Well, that's a big question, uh, Tomas. It's interesting, again, uh, my dinosaur hat. The, the pendulum, every, every movement has a pendulum, right? And it starts out here where you go, man, there, isn't, there, is, there aren't any opportunities. The, le the playing field isn't level. I'm, I'm really feeling like I, I'm being left out. I'm off to the side of the community, not in the mainstream. And what you try to do is you try to get it to the center point. But also every movement has that tendency to go over and beyond. Yeah. 
sometimes if you're old and philosophical like I'm being right now, maybe too far. Too far. I've spent 40 years trying to get rid of labels to where we're not the gimps uh, or the uh, those handicapped folks. We're people with disabilities, a whole range of disabilities, people first language instead of the old labels. And to be honest with you, this is my editorial comment, I'm, wor I'm now working with a generation of young students with disabilities that can't wait to get the label. Mm -hmm. Parents are calling and wondering where they can go for testing. They'll spend thousands of dollars. I'm going, wait a minute, I spent 40 years trying to get rid of labels. Now this generation can't wait to get them for one of two reasons. Either they think they're going to have to do less or it's going to be some advantage. So across the country, it's not just my philosophy, but across the country, offices like this are trying to turn back the reins. And I never thought that I'd, we'd have to work on independence issues again and self-sufficiency and, and uh, self-advocacy and stuff, but that's the way the pendulum is swung. We've e we're even in the process of changing the office's name. It's going from Office of Disability Services to Office of Disability Resources. It sends a different message. Because the attitude coming at me sometimes is, okay, I'm broken, what are you going to do to fix me? Not, what are, what are the opportunities or how do I go about navigating the system? What are you going to do to, what are you going to do for me next? And I just don't think that's a healthy position for people in our movement to put themselves in. Um, that's the editorial. The pendulum has swung a little far. So the project is to do exactly that, Tomas. And you've been a lot of help. Audiovisual. It's, it's a concept called universal design. The goal would be for offices like mine to go away, just become obsolete. They're not needed. If I need a screen reader program because I have a vision or a reading disability, Sorry. I can go down to the teaching learning center. They've got that. If I need a smart pen uh, to take better notes, those are sold at Target. They're not in some rehab store someplace. So there's a, there's a leveling of the field that way, I think, through the use of technology that helps everybody. Now we've got to work with the students who have disabilities to just take advantage of the Self-determine, yeah. be self-sufficient, not come in and ask me for something, but simply know on campus where to find those things. So that's the resources part at the end of our title. We're really going to start shifting that to help students connect to resources that are already here. Now the advantage we have is that I'm confident that the resources are here. You know, there's a writing center, there's the tutoring center, there's the teaching learning center in general that a lot of students only look at as tutoring, where they can go and sit down and have their uh, learning style assessed. Look at barriers. How are they getting in the way? What Everybody's wired differently. Everybody learns differently. So there's that kind of movement, I think, afoot on campus. And that's that's how I want to leave it, uh, is more in that, that level. It's a drawn out answer to your good question. I think um, I'd like to ask, since we got some students, I think you attended here before, didn't you? Um, since I deal with the classroom technology, I know that we had an issue just a week or so ago with closed captioning and mm -hmm. the lack of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at some uh, text grabber boxes that we can install into the, the, wow. the classrooms. Now, I, I'm going to have to sit down with you and, and determine what, I don't know what CC1 and CC2 is, mm -hmm. or what the difference or what would be necessary. I probably don't either. <laughs> well, you know, the technology is together. changing so fast. But as students, and as an in, in, uh, employee, what do you think we could in, incorporate into these classrooms to make them more uh, user-friendly mm -hmm. for the disability arena? Well, I think the things we're doing, the smart classrooms, for sure. But, you know, it, it's, it's all the way up the chain um, because they're still producing videos that don't have closed captioning. You know, and, and technically that's against the law, but there's still that filtering out or that educational piece that, um, that is coming. We're, there are tests 
that our Office of Information Technology has on everybody's website and web page and faculty posted information to test whether or not it meets the, the current requirements. A lot of times it doesn't. But it's attitude and it's, it's awareness. Um, faculty member, I've worked with other faculty members who, who are simply putting things on, um, on, uh, um, online and simply don't think about the fact that they've just put a good chart on there that our screen reader programs won't pick up. And they haven't added text or descriptions that, that can be picked up by a screen reader. So, you know, it was 40 years ago when I started out, it was attitude, and now 40 years later, it's still attitude, but it's a changing world. I mean, our attitudes have to keep pace with the technology, and they don't, so we're still going to run behind at times. I certainly don't know all the technology that's out there. I'm still amazed. But what I do like is that you can get it on Amazon.com or at Target. You know, you can still pick it up. It's there. Mm -hmm. It's changing. As, as long as we're on the, um, the thread of education, there's differences for, for students who have disabilities in K-12 through versus college education. So maybe, Nancy, you could touch a little bit on K-12. And then, and then we can come back to all of you and talk about what, what, what was different when you went to college and how that changes okay. in terms of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I am a parent of a child with disability. I'm also a school psychologist. So before I taught at Delta, I worked in the schools and I did assessments of individuals with different kinds of learning or other kinds of disabilities to figure out and help teachers to accommodate their needs and help them to learn the best that they could learn in class. Um, but, but having become a parent of a child with a disability, my whole viewpoint on everything changed because instead of being the gatekeeper, the person who held the keys to letting the kids into special education, I became the advocate mm -hmm. for inclusive education, for universal design. Mm -hmm. um, I love what you said about universal design. One of my favorite um, cartoons is uh, a little girl who's a, using a wheelchair to get into school and there's snow everywhere the person shoveling the stairs, the custodian, and, and he says, I'll get to the ramp as soon as I'm done with the stairs. And she says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all go in. Mm -hmm. So if we just had ramps everywhere and mm -hmm. no stairs anywhere. That's good for the elderly, too. Yeah, yes. everybody yes. can use it. So a lot of people are going to benefit from that. It's mm -hmm. just to open it up so that everyone can use That's it instead of excluding. Example. Yeah. So anyway, um, in, the, in the elementary K-12 through schools, we have... Um, what used to be called 94-142 or IDEA, the law that um, says that children have a right to a free and appropriate, appropriate public education um, along with their peers, non-disabled peers. And so there's all kinds of documentation and testing that goes with it and IEPs which look at the letter of the law but not necessarily the spirit of the law. Um, and there's a lot of parents fighting out there because schools don't have a lot of money and special education is not fully funded by the federal government and so there's always scrambling for this mandated service that is, has to be provided by law but there's no money to back it up. So my son um, went through K-12 through schooling and even though he has very severe significant disabilities in terms of communication and learning he was fully included through the eighth grade. So he was in a general ed kindergarten classroom, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade classrooms um, he had a special education teacher and a support staff person and a team that worked with him, but he was never taken out, never taken away from his same age peers. And because of that, he had this huge circle of support of people that still care about him, even though he's an adult. Um, one of them actually works with him in his home. One has come and helped paint his home. They come back and they visit him. They're friends with him just like they are friends with each other. So that's been a wonderful benefit of the inclusive situation. He also, um, believe it or not, got a better education in an inclusive classroom than he would have gotten in what we would call a center-based program because my experience as a school psychologist and a parent is a lot of the people who teach and care for people in the center-based programs kind of get entrenched in institutional kinds of ways of teaching and helping with behavior. And the people in the general ed classroom don't know anything about it to begin with so they're eager to learn. I mean, once you get past the threshold of, yes, my kid's going to be in your class, once they have that kid in their class and they're kind of darn putting that wall up anymore of fear, then they go to bat for them and they do everything they can. 
and they're innovative, and he learned so much more communication-wise and trying new things. Um, and so I'm really a big advocate for inclusive education. Um, I think for any disability. You don't get the stigma as much either. Huh? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you take a group of kids and separate them from everybody else, <laughs> yeah. there can be hard pullbacks. And you know, when he was in kindergarten, the other kids, this was their first school experience. They didn't know that he wasn't supposed to be there with them. Yeah. You know, so they had him all along. Um, so it's been a really good experience for him. Now that he is 22, Michigan has special education through age 26. Um, now that he's 22, he is in a, in a um, central classroom for adults with disabilities because there are no same age peers in the high school. He's in the high school, he participates in the high school, but there's no classroom for her to go, him to go to that's inclusive. What would be inclusive for him now would be to come to Delta and participate in some kind of, I don't know, technical kinds of training classes where he could actually take part in it. And one other thing I wanted to say that you talked about was technology. The communication boards that we used to have to purchase for people like my son Jacob or people with such severe cerebral palsy that they can't speak it used to be six, eight thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. Now you can get all that stuff on an iPad, two hundred bucks. So there are. My son has an iPad and he has all kinds of programs on there for communication. He just touches and it says, "I want pudding. I need to go to the bathroom." You know, mm -hmm. we used to, used to have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for that. So yeah. technology Amazing. is catching up in terms of universal yeah. design for those kinds of things. Very good. No, now, did, did you finish up high school oh. after the accident? I was 27 when I was injured. So okay. Yeah, I thought so you were past. Yeah, I went back to college when I was 25, so I had two years in at Delta prior to my injury, and then returned after I got hurt. Wow. No. I was an old man when I went back to school. <laughs> <laughs> an old man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Not yeah. Yeah. Well, well, let's shift it around a little bit and talk about, and, and the next question is the rest of you. Get the next question. I got this one up. Um, Talk a little bit about the personal part of, of just going through the process of, of being injured. You know, one moment not having an injury to then having an injury, or Jake, in your case, you know, not knowing that you're going to lose your vision and all of a sudden losing your vision. You know, whether you want to talk about just that experience or that process or depression or you know wherever you want to go with that. Any of you? You want to go first? I know. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, as far as uh, being in a chair and not knowing what's the matter with me, well, that wasn't no biggie to me because I didn't know any different. I mean, you know, I'm just this way. That's the way I'm supposed to be because I was born this way. Um, my biggest one was probably my vision because um, I was uh, checking coolers like for glass containers um, in the in the racetrack you know at the front gate and then all of a sudden I started seeing specs and I'm like man maybe I got a headache this ain't right so I went and I told the friends that I took there hey I'm going home because you know I think I got a headache I'm just seeing weird stuff like mm -hmm. you, you know um, remember uh, the road runner, he like gets smoked and sees stars, whatever. Well, mine's like blotchies. Um, like a mirror, you're tilting a mirror in the sun, reflecting off of the water, stuff like that. Um, so I, I went and got my friends, and they're in a hurry so we could get home and figure this out. And she ended up falling and breaking her ankle off the bleachers. It was kind of fun thinking about it back then. But, um, well, you got to know my friend, too. Um, so we went home, and I'm uh, telling my mom, you know, I got to have a headache. It doesn't hurt, but I'm seeing stuff. And then two days later, um, I couldn't see out my left eye. I mean, I can see out it, but like I said, I got peripheral. If I close my eye, I can't see you at all. Not her, you. I can see her right now, but I can't see you. It, um, it's a solid <coughs> yellow, blue thing. Um, you guys don't get sick easy, do you? <laughs> well, it, it's like if you sneeze and bring your hand back, it's that solid thing that you see. I can't see through it. 
But oh, that that happened, and then we go down to Ann Arbor, and um, they're they're talking to me like I'm not even there, like I can't see them. I mean, they're talking to my parents, and that was very hard to accept. Um, and then I finally get out of there. You know, it yeah, it was depressing. I mean, because I mean. All this is closing in, and the uh, very first thing that went through my head was my kids. I got two kids, and my mom's talking to me in the car, you know, what you think of the appointment? <laughs> and I had some choice words, but what would you think of the appointment? I mean, do you want to talk about anything? Try and be supportive in a weird way. <laughs> so um, we were talking, and... She would make me feel better. I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do about, you know, boyfriends or if they get married. I don't know what to do, you know. I'm acting like an idiot because that's all I know how to act like at that moment. And my dad says, well, um, well, if they bring the guy home, you know, fiancé, whatever, and if he don't let you feel his face to look at him, then... He's no good for her, so I tell him to hit the road. And we'd laugh and stuff, and, you know, and then I, I'd come home and throughout life, I wouldn't get as mad at things as people think you should. Like, um, I do a lot of stuff on my own, and I'd be walking in town, well, a lot of them curbs aren't cut. And I can't tell if they're a cut or not until I fall off them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but, I mean, I'll go and I'll fall right off the curb and there will be a group of people around me and they're like basically, oh my God, you know, he fell. But I'll get up and I'm like, well, I won't do that again. You know, or, I mean, I was uh, babysitting once and I couldn't tell. There was a sidewalk, and then, you know, you pull your car in, and I couldn't tell the different shades of it, and I had a little girl in my life while I was babysitting, and I fell off the sidewalk, but I, when you're in different situations, you guys do it too, you train yourself to adapt to the danger predicament, so I just took her in and twisted and made sure I hit first, but, I mean, I've, I've derfed here, I... I would hit the wall. I would cut corners too short. And you can't do nothing but laugh if you sit and get mad at how you messed up. Then, you know, that's a second of your life that you wasted. So there's no use of getting mad at it. Anybody else want to share their experience? It was pretty rough. Um, rough? Uh, I'm winded. <laughs> <laughs> Like they, we, uh, I spent two months at very uh, free bed rehab hospital in Grand Rapids, and I don't think we were required, but they had to see a psychiatrist. And you know, she told me that you're going to go through the stages, just as if you would, you know, as if you had lost somebody. And I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. Yeah, right. <coughs> and the further along I went, the r I realized. Oh, I'm in this stage, I'm in this stage, I'm in this stage. And at first it was denial, I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll be better, I'll recover. And then after that, it kind of set in a little bit and went through the depression and all that stuff. And then, um, anger. Did you yeah, anger? Yeah, anger, depression. I had talked to my friends, I uh, was kind of shut in, didn't really do a whole lot. And then, Basically, I got to the point where I was so bored and tired of being in the house. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to go do whatever I want to do. And luckily, I had the support from my family and friends. I mean, they were excellent. They helped me with everything that I needed. So got through it. But it was, it was really hard. It took a good year to come around. Very difficult. Yeah, the, the abruptness of, of the experience, I think, is is different than having been born with it or having a lingering illness. And, um, mine was certainly abrupt. I was 24, but I, had, I was in my second summer of a summer job that was just perfect. I mean, I had started water skiing probably when I was 9 or 10 years old, 
and I skied with a, a, a ski club out of uh, Flint area, Silver Lake, and we actually got paid to put on water ski shows around Michigan and Ohio and Indiana, uh, Wisconsin, a couple times up in the Dells. So it was something I did well and never thought about getting hurt doing it. I mean, you'd, I'd see it, I'd read about it, but you know, it's it's the way we get through life. It's always someone else. It's it's those people. It's not us. Uh, if we if we didn't do that, we'd never drive again, would we? I mean, we wouldn't get in the car. So. Um, it wasn't an unusual fall on a 4th of July Saturday. Uh, Black Lake, anybody familiar with Black Lake up by Sheboygan? At the state park, it's a lot like Higgins Lake, and it's very shallow, way out. So we were doing the show there, and, and again, never gave it a thought, but I, I fell in about three feet of water and, and hit the bottom. And so it was one of those instant experiences. You know, one you right second, yeah. one second, you're, you're fine, the next... Uh, next second, you're permanently disabled. So, and just as Noah said, those stages were all were all there, especially the denial. And and it it wasn't denial fighting it so much. It was just being naive. Again, if you're on the inside looking out of a brand new experience, you just you don't pay attention. I mean, that's part of of people. Where I learned that from a sociology professor. We're very self-centered, and not in a negative way. But you 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 know you are your own. Uh, your, your own universe, so what happens with us is, is what's significant. What happens to people out there, we can we can get out of that self-centeredness once in a while. See, uh, I had a hard time. My mom really had a hard time. She uh, yeah. she wasn't eating. I mean, she was so like sick, just worried sick. Mm -hmm. And that bothered me at the time more than it, mm -hmm. like, my own, like, seeing my family just like, yeah, you know, what you feel you're doing through, to others. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. Yeah. To sit back and not be able to comfort your family, nothing you can do. You just have to sit there and, yeah. you know, go through the whole ordeal. But that I think that bothered me more than like I could handle. I knew what I was gonna have to go through, but I'm like, boy, this is really hard on my family. Mm -hmm. And they feel helpless. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, they, they don't know what to do. You know, it's it's the old adage there, but for the grace of God go I. I mean, you you know, it was abrupt. Um, it's I mean, disability, unlike any other movement, I always thank Charisse for putting disability on that diversity scale because that's relatively new. Di disability was always handled out there. I mean, it was always, we're scared to death of it as people because it's too close to home, especially the kinds of things we're sharing. I mean, I'm, you know, I represent your next drive home from Delta. You know, I mean, I'm the next time you carry groceries up or, stairs, uh, up or yeah. down the stairs. It can happen in just the blink of an eye, literally. So I think that's, I learned that early on that that's part of what I experienced in terms of the gap between people. You know, it's not that they were discounting me or discarding me, it's that they didn't know how to handle me. And rather than take a chance and be wrong, we tend to avoid those things, we, we're not going to take chances as people. I mean, it's I learned it the hard way going back to CMU, but it's it it hasn't changed any. Um, it's easier to avoid than encounter. I learned that from that same sociology professor. Rather than take a chance and be wrong or be awkward or say something wrong to Noah or uh, you know change his mood, let's just avoid it altogether. And I much personally, I much prefer that people ask. Oh yeah, I'd yeah. rather somebody if they have a question about anything about my disability. Yeah, I'm not offended if they ask, you know, or ask me if I need help. That doesn't bother me. But However, right. that takes them being able to step yeah, out there yeah. and do it. However, at the same time, I have friends um, who get really offended if you know people ask for if they need uh -huh. help, and I think a lot of that's just them being bitter. Yeah, but everybody handles I'm not, it differently. Yeah, I'm not offended by it. I like, love it when little kids come up to oh, me and yeah. say, what's wrong with him? Yeah, and point right, yeah. Because then I get a chance to explain it yeah. instead of their mom saying, don't stare. Yeah. Just, you know. The purity of that. Yeah. Jake mentioned earlier, I mean, feeling that people are talking around you. That's the first thing I started noticing, even in the hospital. Um, uh, uh, being objectified, you know, talking across the bed uh, as though you're not there. Uh, early on, again, socially, um, because there, people weren't experienced with people like me uh, being out in the community. And I'd have waitresses come up 
and ask somebody else at the table what I'd like to eat. <laughs> you know, that extreme. I mean, people just were unsure. So I think more there's, you know, the more of us that are out here and the longer we've lived, you know, the, the easier that kind of thing gets. But it didn't start out that way. Mike, what are the numbers in uh, how many disability individuals are in Yeah, the that's always a tough one. The latest, the latest that I've heard is that uh, about one in five, or 20 percent. You know, it, the best thing that uh, for the Americans with Disabilities Act that goes to back to 1990 was that they put a number on it. Does anybody remember that number? Because it got people's attention. Because again, it's it's been one of those movements that's so hard to put a handle on. Because you got four people here with four very different disability experiences. Even though three of us are in chairs, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean a same, thing yeah, in terms of common ground or yeah. common experiences. So it's always been difficult. But they put the number of 49 million Americans. And that really had an impact because all of a sudden it was a number and it was a large population. The latest that I've seen is is about 10 million more, about 59 million right now. That uh, you know, but you know, not only have we gotten better at technology, but the medi the medical, the preventative care, that kind of thing. Noah said he spent three months at Mary Freebed. Uh, ah, two uh, two months. I was five months at U of M. And actually did pretty well in getting out earlier. Yeah. It wasn't unusual to be six or seven months with a spinal cord injury. I think um, I was in there a total of three years, uh, two and a half weeks mm -hmm. at U of M, and then two and a half months of her treatment. So. That's a good point because my child, if he had been born even ten years earlier, would not have survived. Yeah, would have had right. Chance, you know? because no, my doctor told me the same thing. He said, you, "You can thank Vietnam yeah. War." All the soldiers that came you back. You can thank you know. the Vietnam War for even survived, you know, from Black Lake to, to Ann Arbor you know. because of what they could do. I asked a, a social worker, I put her on the spot one day, I said, well, how, how much is this going to shorten my life? And she didn't want to answer me, and she finally said, well, you can subtract 25%, the statistics now, you can subtract 25% off the... Uh, the expected uh, uh, lifeline of a male. And at that time, it was 72.3. So I did the rough math and say, well, I'm barely going to see 50. I mean, it was 54 or something like that. And what was interesting, I mean, that had an effect on me for the next 20 years, always thinking, you know, in, that, in those terms. But in the meanwhile, preventative care, antibiotics, things had come along to where by the time I hit 50, and it was a really big party, <laughs> I, I made it. Um, that really, that gap had gone away, and it really isn't there anymore. It, you know, we've got the care, we've got the the wherewithal that people are living longer with disabilities, and uh, but luckily for the dinosaur in the room, um, you know, there isn't there is a, there's been more of an equalizer. Do the disability laws include uh, mental illness? Sure. Is that included also? So it's yeah. pretty broad. It's yeah. all encompassing. Anyone? Very knows. broad. Okay. As long as it affects a major life activity, that was yeah. always the you know, and, and learning can be part of that. That's why there are so many more students with learning disabilities being included in that because that's considered a major life activity. Does Michigan have extens extensive uh, disability laws over federal government. What I mean is like above and beyond with the federal government. We have places like Highland Pines, okay, which is a school specifically for people that have learning dis major learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. They go through age 26. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with Highland Pines or a school like it. But I, I've lived in uh, multiple states and I don't remember ever coming across that type of educational program mm -hmm in any other state. Michigan has, is the only state that has 26. Mm -hmm. Every other state stops at 18 or 21. Yeah. So there's an age line and that, that's what makes the... The, the uh, federal law says, I believe, 21, 21, 21, 21, and Michigan carries it out five more years. Yeah, we're the only one. We were also the first state to go all the way down to zero before the law required it. Before it was five years old and then it moved down to three years old. Mm -hmm. Michigan was, was seeing babies way before then. I wonder what the history of that is. It must have been um, some of our congressmen or yeah, congressmen or just more proactive. somebody probably 
the government mm -hmm. was dealing with something. Well, we we passed uh, uh, handicappers right or handicapper civil rights act in 1976. And the only reason I remember that is because that was part of my workshop to go back and kind of look at the history. And it was a very aggressive group of people, um, actually at Michigan State. And because Michigan State is so well located for the for the legislature, yeah, right, right, right in Lansing, this group got their attention enough that actually Michigan became one of the models for the eventual Americans with Disabilities Act because we were aggressive about it. Um, and I would do a thing on language, but has anybody heard the term handicapper? It's a Michigan term. It used to just, we used to get kidded about it. Um, I was never comfortable with it. It was an attempt back in those days to, to, to give disability more action-oriented thinking. I mean, handicapped is a very passive word. It, there were words like uh, invalid. I mean, think of the word invalid, <laughs> invalid. Think of the roots of that word. Um, people were were described by their disability. You know, you didn't have a seizure disorder back in '76. You were an epileptic. No. Uh, you were mongoloid instead of down person with Down syndrome. You were a mongoloid. I mean, think of the things that we did to one another. The deaf and dumb. Yeah, unbelievable. So people first language and that's, yeah, finally there was that evolution of it, but it took a long time to get there. And so we were labeled that way, and that, again, that's why I just cringe with this pendulum swinging to, to now. I mean, I had a girl here sat down with me and she said, I'm, I'm a dyslexic. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Don't put the label on yourself, you know, and then, so I don't... But she's heard society throw that at her. Well, and she just, she was in because that was going to, that was going to be good for her. I mean, where the rest of us, I mean, I grew up trying to avoid that kind of stuff. I just wanted to join back in the community where I'd been. And I always thought it was ironic. We, we spend the first few years of our life trying to stick out in the crowd, be noticed. Now all I wanted to do was blend in, and it was never going to happen. And it never, never I have happened. a had, she's passed away now, but I had a sister who spent, from the time she was two years old, she had polio. She was, mm -hmm. When she was two years old, she was 64 when she died. So she wow. spent 62 years in and out of wheelchairs. Yeah. And it never, it never dawned on me when I was, she was just a member of the family. Okay. We didn't have a ramp on our house. We had our house set up three feet off the ground. I never thought of it. The thought never crossed our minds to put around when she, when those times when she was in a wheelchair, when, when she got home, we just walked out, picked the wheelchair up, carried it upstairs in the house. You know, my mother always said, "You can do anything. You just have to do it differently than, than other people." You know, and she was a very very strong woman. You know, she would get up in the morning. She lived independently when she was in crutches. She'd have to get up in the morning and put her crutches on and, and get up. She walk to work two miles down the road, walk to work in her crutches, and a very, very strong woman. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that I believe that my mother never accepted it as a handicap, uh -huh. rather as a life challenge. Uh -huh. you know, but the thought of, of putting a wheelchair on my house, I never thought about it until just now. So it, it never, yeah, it didn't you know, occur. in the 60s, who would have thought of that? Yeah. The well, interesting once, thing yeah. about the labels is that is that the law forces us to look for labels yeah, to does, get services. So my yes. child you have to meet certain has to have a label to get the special education, yep. to get the money, to get right. where he lives in his own I think own that's home a very now. good point, Nancy. I think that's what's So that's kids what's come happened. out of school having said, my mom says, I have dyslexia, no. therefore yeah. I deserve help with this and this and right. this. They come to Delta College, they've learned to be good self-advocates. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I know it. Yeah, and so it's we've got to try to change that. Yeah. It really is a catch-22. Handicapper didn't last long because huh. all the other states in the country made fun of it. It sounded like something that we do. Hi, I'm a snowmobiler. Hi, I'm a handicapper. Uh, it was for the right reasons, maybe from a philosophical standpoint, but it didn't hold up. But until 1989, you could still find it in Michigan law because it never we got to the point where legislators were sending over drafts. I actually got to look at and, and mark up the uh, 
the curb cut law that you're talking about and some of the parking laws that came out in the late 70s. And so this group in Michigan State had enough clout that when they'd send something back, instead of disabled or handicapped, it was handicapper. And it got passed in legislation. <laughs> so there was a big deal in the movement a few years ago and that finally became extinct in, uh, in Michigan law. Language is, is a riot when yeah. you think of it. I'd like to mention something too before I forget. Um, sure. Like my niece and nephew, my nephew was one and a half, and my niece was three. When I got hurt, I actually lived with my sister and brother-in-law uh, for almost a year after I was out of the hospital. Um, and they were completely accepting of the wheelchair. They had no idea. Mm -hmm. At that age, they thought it was cool. Every time I'd hop on the couch, they were fighting over who would get to ride in my wheelchair. And at one and a half, my nephew could pop a wheelie in my wheelchair. <laughs> like, he could pop the front tires uh -huh. off the ground. He was all over the house in it. Um, and then the other day, my girlfriend was telling me that her daughter, uh, who is six years old, and I believe, I want to say first grade, uh -huh. um, they had an educational program at school where they brought in wheelchairs and walkers and uh, equipment to familiarize the kids with different disabilities and uh, I thought that was kind of neat. The more educated kids are growing up, the, you know, the less of a big deal it's going to be when they encounter exactly. people. But that, yeah, that was really, really cool. I didn't know they were doing that. And yeah, I've never missed school. an opportunity to go into a grade yeah, school because you know. of that. And it used to be, you know, you'd say, well, how many of you know somebody in a wheelchair? And virtually no hands would go yeah. up, or maybe somebody had a grandmother or grandfather. Now you do it, and, and most of the hands go up, you know, that it's become normalized and, and just a part of life uh, rather than off to the side. And that's kind of what Nancy was saying before, is that your son has a lot of friends. He went through his whole co cohort sure. uh, of, yeah. of school buddies. Mm -hmm you know, right there with them. So that whole entire group of, of students probably have a problem with disability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, some yep. of them have gone into the field of yeah. disability or mm -hmm. medicine and they attribute it to having known him, yep. which is really neat. So he has impact on people's lives, even though he's sure. very pulled within himself and you look at him, you wouldn't think he could impact anything. Yep. And he has made Despite large impact on a lot of people. Yeah. Um, Real quick, uh, when they were talking about beds, um, I I might have had one when I was real little, but um, the one I remember right now is going to my blind school. Uh, it's down Kalamazoo. You know, they teach you how to adapt and all that, you know. And um, I was supposed to be there, I estimated, at eight months. And... I know I'm talking about it like it's a prison, but I was out in three. That's why I felt about, yeah, I felt like I was in prison. I was out in three because I was adapting way a lot faster than the other people were. And I I just had a better outlook on it. it it's what you make it is the big one. And when I was down there, um, we had a little, you know, a smoke shack. You couldn't smoke in the building, but you could smoke out there. And there'd be a lot of talk and a lot of whining, if you want to call it that, about, you know, I can't see. And there was a lot of, you know, offing themselves. And, well, then I'd jump in because I can't stand that talk. And, you know, and then they're like, you know, looking around for me. It, it was funny but um, because I was like one of the ones out of like four people that had low vision everybody else was totally couldn't see nothing they're looking around for me and everything and well then they found out I was in a chair and then they found out I got two kids and I'm losing my sight and this and that and this and that and next thing I know they're like well what are we whining about we can walk. We have kids. We have this. We have that. We just can't see. Well, and then by the time my three months were up, out of them eight people, five didn't want to do it anymore. And, you know, I, I don't know, I, I got some kind of 
way of talking to people, I guess. But um, it's you know the mobility training, the you know cooking. I mean, I just blew through the cooking, and I don't use the measuring cup when I cook. Huh. Where are my fingers like they teach you? I just do it in my head, you know. And uh, another thing is um, my uh, well, no, that wasn't that good down there. But um, now when I cook, my my left eye is getting worse. It's like uh, if you put a drop of food coloring in water and it expands out, you know, like my my black spot. I think you call it pupil. I don't know, but um, it's like it's expanding out, you know, and so I can't see through it. Well, as it's expanding out, my hearing's picking up. And when I cook, you can hear how much seasoning you're using. I mean, you kind of look like an idiot going like this, but you can hear. You can hear and feel how much water you're putting in paint. And, I mean, I, I live in an apartment complex, and there's um, eight um, apartments in the building. There are three of them. And the people that are in my building will give me a request to cook because I'm just that way. I mean, I'll, I'll have big groups of people over just cook for, you know. And it just goes over very good. But your handicap, if that's what you want to call it, is what you make it. I mean, if you want to look at the whole big picture and you guys want to be mad at me, that's okay. But we're all handicapped. We just deal with it differently. But we're lucky enough to show ours off. <laughs> <laughs> like what you're saying about like doing things differently as in like feeling or something like that. I could put my wheelchair together in the dark, like getting out of my car. Uh, I've done it so many times. I I know right where like the hole that these armrests go into. Mm -hmm. I have to reach way out. And lean like that, I can do it without even looking at it. Huh. Just by placing my hand in a certain position, and <laughs> it's amazing. Like after you get used to it. Well, that's what I mean by unique abilities. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're cook by, you're, you cook by the way you know, method for cooking is definitely a unique ability, not a disability. I uh, um, well, I did go to school here. I'm still trying, but I did go to school here, and I had a psychology class here. Well. We, one day we were talking about mutation and, you know, about how my parts didn't fully mutate or whatever, you know, or maybe I just mistook the story, but it <laughs> sounded good in my head. And so I started looking at myself that day as like an X-Men, that we're all, you know, X-Men, we just show it differently, you know. I have yet to meet one that can shoot fire from his eyes, though. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, and... I don't know, it looks good, Kel. <laughs> yeah, right. That's where that I, came from. I mean, Mike's got different ones, he's got different ones, she's got different ones. But, you know, I, I have the eye thing, I have the physical thing. Plus, if you look at my feet, I look like the Aquaman. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> and you got to have humor. I mean, yeah, even was, yeah. you guys, them, they got to have humor. That's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a part of life, not no disability, not nothing. You, know, I, you just have to have that. I agree. Who's got another question? We love questions. Come on. I got something. I, I went through a, <clears throat> an experience with my son, and I know you guys were talking about the technology, how it improved over the years. It's, it's, it's fascinating because... My son was in a car accident, he was five, well, his mother was in a car accident, and his, he broke his arm, and it, the bone was sticking out and everything, and, and uh, he spent three months at Mary Freebed. Yeah. We lived in Grand Haven at the time. The and, pediatric, uh, pediatric wards. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, he spent a lot of time there, and then he went to rehab afterwards, and he pretty much lost all the function in his arms, couldn't move his fingers, couldn't... All he could do was lift his shoulder like this. Mm. So he went to, I don't know how many specialists, went all over the place. And like Jake said, we were ready to give up. You know, let's just prepare him. 
mm -hmm. or is going to, you know, and stop, you know, poking and prodding and, you know, let's just get it prepared. And uh, one, we talked to one of his therapists and she said, you know, I want you to go see this one last doctor. I'm just going to ask you to do that. One last doctor and we'll see what happens. And we had already seen all these specialists mm -hmm. and x-rays and tests and tests and tests and nobody could figure out why his, he couldn't get his movement back. Nerve damage. So we go to this doctor's office and this is, you know, it's, it's, to me it was a miracle. Because we go to this doctor's office and we're there for about 15 minutes and he says, yeah, I'll, I'll fix it next week. We'll <laughs> set a date. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, they stuck the nerve in the bone when they reset it. Wow. So it's pinched the nerve. It was two years that he didn't have function. That's what's oh still scary gosh. about who you okay. see and when you oh see him. Man. You couldn't feel nothing. Mm. Or the nerve okay. was totally okay. shut off. They, the bone had grown around the nerve. Right. So they had to re-break it, pull the nerve off. But, I mean, he got all of his function back after. Wow. Yeah. That would be so scary. That's always scary about who you see and yeah. when you see them and who did you miss. You know, I, I think might, that's I might be grandma. Right. It's almost like going to you know to the to the casino. That one uh -huh. that one last coin. You know, maybe mm -hmm. I can win this time. Yeah. And if we would have went to see that last doctor. He would have stayed that way. Mm -hmm. So you're advocating gambling. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because we sort of grow up thinking doctors know everything. Yeah. You know and. You, you do what the doctor says, and I've learned over the last 22 years that some doctors no, just true. are not doing yeah. it yeah. right. Do the there are a lot of really wonderful doctors out yeah. there, but you have to really find the ones that... And I learn to shop for the doctors that will give me what I need for my kid because I know him better than any doctor does, and I know his history, and I've researched enough to know what happens in CHARGE syndrome with this, and this. I know we need this therapy yeah. now and that yeah. test. So I just have to find the doctor that will listen to me. I was okay. in the hospital with several people who were paralyzed from surgeries. Like they, they actually had malpractice suits and everything. Mm -hmm. So, so wrong. yeah, no. doctors are people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is true. That is true. Yeah. What has no? What have you been able to do that you don't? What I mean is, in what way has your handicap? Allowed you to reach out to people that you wouldn't have been able to do. Before. Oh, my! I spent. I don't like asking many ways. But oh yeah, I spent a lot more time with my friends and family, which was nice. Before I got hurt, I was working 50 hours a week, going to school full time, and everything I did was for me. So being around my family and just getting to like, you know, if it's watching my niece and nephew or doing whatever, just spending time with my family. Um, I've also, uh, like I've spoken at high schools uh -huh. and things of that sort. Um, uh, just being out in the community and encountering people and talking to people. A lot of people do ask questions, which is nice. So I don't have a lot of time to, to be an advocate right now, like, but I am kind of on a daily basis with people I encounter. Set in by example? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, just being out there. Yeah. Yeah, and I've met people that aren't out there. Like they, like I said that first year, I didn't leave the house hardly at all. I just didn't want to. Yeah. Well, part of understanding diversity and really being able to relate to it is to put a face on it. Yeah. So that's why I yeah. think the panels are such a no. such an effective way to really deal with this topic. It's so broad and wide ranging and and different for each individual. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I think that's been part of the struggle for the disability movement when we were talking about the law. And the one that always fascinates me is if you look at at um, racial and gender equality, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I mean, major, major landmark legislation changed the face of America. And yet, for the disability movement, not till 1990 was Americans with Disabilities Act, and it was over the same issues. Yeah. It just took us that long as a disability community to get our act together because it's it's too diverse. I mean, I I remember coming out of the hospital at U of M and coming back to Saginaw and the, and the social worker saying, you've got to find a self-help group. That was still back in those, those days when that was the, the mantra. And I did. I found a group. Then there were 11 chair users out at the old uh, Saginaw Hospital. Um, and I went twice. 
And I came away thinking, there isn't one thing that I've got in common with those other ten people other than the chair. No. So you could never group yourself just by disability. And I've talked to friends that, that certainly have had their own racial or ethnic struggles. They say, well, it's the same for us. But I think it was even more so with disability because it's such a broad Wide spectrum. spectrum yeah. it, you can't pinpoint it yeah. down. And so we never felt that sense of community. The, the blind community has a much different issue than spinal cord injuries or, mm -hmm. you know, or then the right. deaf community is still very, very uh, segregated in its own And own even needs. among the groups, like, it's for, spy, for instance, spinal cord injuries, my level of injury, I broke C6 and C7. Mm -hmm. I know guys that broke the same vertebrae and have damage that are walking. Yeah. And, yeah. and so each individual injury is so different that... And then you, sorry. Oh, no. And then you add in the group of people, parents of people who have autism. Oh, oh yeah. People yeah, with mental so mental impairment me or mental so retardation or whatever yeah, the different the levels term of the yeah. jury is. But, you know, so how do you advocate, how do those people advocate for just being, getting the respect yeah, they need right. versus, you know, it's a oh. huge group. Yeah. Huge, huge group. And the hidden disability, I think, is, is tougher. I, I always thought I yeah. had an advantage in that mine's very visible. Yeah. It, it was like, here I am. You know, you either jump back in or you don't. But there wasn't the hiding it. And human nature hasn't changed over those 40 years. If we can hide it, we will. But you still see that where, like you said, Dave, the waitress would come up and ask your companion mm -hmm. what you wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not seeing the, the person. They're mm -hmm. seeing the disability. But a person who has it's a disability afraid. that you can't see yeah. might get overlooked. They might need special attention. Yeah, and they're too they they get time. overlooked. They yeah. don't speak up for themselves. So yeah, I work in a brain injury center, and every single we can have two two patients at the exact same accident. Yep. Totally oh, different. Yeah. One of them is, is cognitive. One of them is not. One of them is able to yeah. feed himself. One of them is not. The different, you know, but people don't see that, and I think prior to all of the, the changing the laws and everything, I don't think there were that many, it wasn't that there weren't the handicapped people around, it's that people didn't see them. They simply didn't see right. them. You walk down the hallway and there's a person over there in a wheelchair and you just go, you simply do not mm -hmm. notice that this is a, a person in a wheelchair, not a wheelchair. Right. You know? Right. You get uh, funny looks, like I'll go to a restaurant and you know alone and they'll give me a menu and then they look at me like I'm an idiot because I ask what's on the menu you know yeah. and they're like well look at it and you're like well I would if I could but you know I mean I they're they're out there at Kalamazoo but around here mm -hmm. braille menus are hard to find unless you especially ask for them and Nine chances out of ten, you especially asked for them, they got them. Yeah. Really? I don't think I've ever heard one. I don't, I, I've ever seen one. You did? I don't think I've ever heard one. Oh, I mean, I, I about uh, crapped myself the other day because I went to the post office and I was just being nosy and I'm stealing their, uh, um, where you pay with the credit card machine. And I'm like, wow, when did you guys get Braille on this? Because they didn't have a Braille one before. You know, I mean, I, I'm not Superman. I can't read Braille that good because, you know, it's just an acceptance thing I'm not willing to take yet because I can still read big print. Uh -huh. But, you know, I mean, you got Braille in elevators and stuff, but what about the menus, you know, or I go to McDonald's and it's right up there on the board, but what would you like to eat? Well, I don't know. What do you have? Well, then they give you a stare down. And... Uh -huh. I know I can't see faces good, but if I'm close enough to you, you can tell, right? like over a counter, I can tell. And let me tell you, they're the ones that look like idiots, <laughs> you know? And, you know, I'm, I mean, like uh, when I uh, got my apartment, um, my landlord was all like, oh my gosh, because she assumed... That's another big killer, but that goes for everybody, not just handicapped people, but you see it more so in handicapped people than not, because people assume way too much, and you know, and like 
they assume that you can't walk. Well, for all you know, he can. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you don't, I can't, mm. you know, I just walk like somebody off the happy feet. <laughs> but, um, you, my landlord said, we can't rent to you because we have no handicaps open. No handicap apartments open. And I'm like, uh, if I wanted a handicap, I'd ask for one. You know, they assume way too much. So I've been living in a non-handicap apartment for like almost five years now. Right. Asking, I could be going on. Instead right. of asking what accommodations yeah, what you can need. we mm -hmm. help you with. They I mean, yeah. yeah. I finally said, hey, why don't you put a bar in my bathroom? Huh. You know, because I did fall out and I smoked my toilet. And, but that was my stupidity, not, you know, not anything they did. You know, it wasn't the apartment's fault. It was my fault. But people assume way too much. When I was in school, they assumed way too much. I mean, I mean, you know, I can, I would just assume that they can walk till I get to know them. I mean, they could be just like me. Who knows? You know? So you're saying you ask rather than just assume. Yeah, that, that is another big pet peeve thing that I got is assume. You know, just because you looked the part, I'm going to assume you're the part. No, you communicate. You know, Back you ask. People um, not being willing to he, see that. He's yeah. got a, a ramp story, and I think that fits in. Which one? You remember? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old, Jake. I mentioned that terrible thing. It was something about your friend pushing up a ramp or something. I may give it away if you don't remember it. <laughs> oh, yeah. How about, how about this? We don't, we do only have a few minutes left. So how about if we were to go down, um, just go down the tape, and if you guys could share one or two things that if you could share with the general public, the whole entire world. Um, you know, Love life to the fullest. How, how uh -huh. we could better accommodate the needs that you have, you know, the accommodations. Um, you know, what would you like to see the rest of us do a little bit better than we do? One of them, Jake, would be to not assume. Uh, you should come and talk to you instead of assuming, right? Yeah. Okay. Get to know you as a person instead of thinking you're just your chair. Yeah. Excellent. Mike? I'm stealing Noah's. Don't be afraid to ask. Uh, just communicate. I mean, it was. it's amazing. I worked at an agency. I got a phone call one day because uh, I had done some advocacy work in the community and this uh, older gentleman calls me and his neighbor, John, had had a stroke and was using an Amigo, that kind of electric scooter, going out and it was winter and he was still going out and getting his mail. And the, the gentleman's calling me, a total stranger, and said, what should I do? I, I really want to to uh, to help John, but I don't know what I should do. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know how I got it. And my it. brilliant trained professional answer was, why don't you ask John? <laughs> and yeah, here's an example of somebody so afraid to take that chance yeah. and communicate and not be wrong and be embarrassed or awkward correct, yeah. that he was key, he was staying away from his own neighbor and being able to help. I mean, we still, we fall over that all the time. Ask. Yeah, well, that's basically, I guess, all I, all I can think of. Um, it's nice too. I mean, people always ask me. I'll be at the gas station. I'll be getting in out of my car. They're like, oh, can I help you with that? And I don't. I don't take offense to it. But logical reasoning supports that I somehow got into the car on my own. I got to <laughs> pump my gas on my own, went in the store on my own. Pretty sure I can get my chair back <laughs> in my car. So I. I mean, I don't know. It's it doesn't, it doesn't affect me. It's, not, it's nice. There, there are times I'm sure I'm going to need help. Mm -hmm. So, hey, if you want to ask if I need help, I don't mind. Well, I think there's genuine, kind people out yeah. there. Just yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an the abundance of people that are willing to help. Right. Asking if you need help is better than ignoring. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. By far. I guess I'm on, I guess I'm the, the contingent for people with developmental disabilities here on the mm -hmm. panel. Um, and for people with developmental disabilities, many of them are isolated. Uh, I have friends who have mental impairment, Down syndrome, things like that, who I have a f specific friend who uh, 
lives with someone and he considers her his wife. She's gay. He doesn't know it. They pool their money so they can have a home, community mental health sponsored home, and they have a wonderful, you know, they, they're they're independent, completely independent. But she doesn't want to live with him. She doesn't have a choice because you know she wants the choice to live with who she wants to live with. So as independent as that is, and as well as the system works, it doesn't always. She's very isolated. Her friends are all other people with disabilities. She doesn't like that, and I think. Also, with my son, I would say take some time, get to know people, because people see my son and they say, "Oh, autism." You know, he doesn't he doesn't have autism. He behaves that way sometimes, and they'll just you know, they're afraid of him because he's got so many disabilities, right? And if and people who get to spend time with him discover that he's just a really really neat guy, and they just fall for him. They just fall in love with him, and then they want to be around him all the time. And just take that time to get to know people. Cross that fear barrier like you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, it's a gap. It's yeah. the gap. They have a lot to offer. You know, I just, I don't know, might might know this gentleman, but he, I don't know if he's taking classes here, I believe so. I can't remember his first name. But I see him in the library a lot, and he stopped me one day. And he's an older guy, and he's, um, he's got some, I'm, I'm not sure what he has, mm -hmm. but he has some type of disabilities now. And he had this folder with him. And he's, he just wanted to talk to me, and I'd never met him before. He just stopped me and wanted to talk to me. Started showing me these pictures. And they're pictures of him with, like, the president. Oh, I know you mean, yeah. Yeah, and, like, he was some type of, I don't yeah. know, he worked for the government, and, I mean, uh -huh. he was a very important person in the United States. And uh -huh. here he is, and everybody looks at him like, you know, who is this guy? Why is he here in Delta, you know? And, you know, you just uh -huh. don't, and that's the assuming part. Uh -huh. Everybody uh -huh. sees him, don't you know, know how important he was. And what the role he played, mm -hmm. you know, before he he ended, you know, he's came to this point in his right. life, and that's what he's and dealing with. He deserves with that respect, and he's to dealing with that diminishing mm -hmm. capacity, and you know, hanging on to the past to some extent. And we all do that. Yeah, we all do I know that. I do. It's just a natural process. Being six foot, 185 pounds, mm -hmm. athletic, like all my hobbies were centered mm -hmm. around physical activities. That's been a hard transition. I still haven't found new hobbies. I mean, I've tried a few different things. I've tried photography. I've tried, you know, I'm thinking about painting, but it's just like it doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't replace like snowboarding. Do you know my hobby? Flying. You know my yeah. 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 I, I mean, gave that. You guys were both athletes, so oh you were actually yeah. injured being athletic. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was, that that was the hard part. Yeah. But in a, in a way, I mean, I remember you talk about adjustment and how everybody handles it differently. But the people that I saw really handle it poorly were the ones where something happened to them outside of their control. I mean, not that it was yeah, in our control, car accident, but like we gunshot did it something, something, you know, do, doing something we love yeah. rather than hit by a drunk driver or shot in the war yeah. or, you know, where you just feel like a victim. Um, I never had to go through that. I did it to myself. I took my chances. I knew the risks, and so I didn't have to go through that that phase. Yep. That's tough for people. Some never get over that. Jake, you want the final um, word? Huh? Do you want the final word? Well, okay. I, I just want to touch on the hobbies and thing. Um, not really hobbies, but interests, whatever. Um, I uh, well, like here. Um, well, before I lost my sight, I did everything. I did basketball, I jumped bicycle ramps. I mean, I did everything. You tell me I couldn't do it, well, I'm going to do it. And then um, life goes on, and I lose my sight, and I'm here, and I hear there's a, you know, dodgeball team uh -huh. when I went here. I don't know if they still have it, but I'm like, well, you know what? That would be pretty cool if a blind mascot or a blind player, whatever. So I give it a shot, and it was fun. I couldn't do it, but it was fun. I mean, I would be from here to her away, and I couldn't hit you. But it was fun. I mean, just because people would tell you you can't do it, don't listen to people. If you want to try it and have fun doing it and hurt yourself during it, you know, who cares? Just have fun with it. You know, I, I've uh, um, done art. I mean, that's not really a sport, but, you know, I, I've done art, you know, because people are like, or I'm thinking to myself, I can't do art, 
but um, I, I, there was a mention of this class, and I got to come in, and I'm like, yeah, I'll wing it, why not, you know? Well, and then I taught myself something about that. And I not only taught myself about it, but I taught other people on how to look at it, you know, from a blind perspective, you know. And, I mean, I, I totally floored myself. And I floored other people, you know. It, and, I mean, my, my kid came in with me that day. I mean, she floored me out. And you learn a lot from your kids, you know. I mean, you might learn a lot from us because we're telling you what goes on in life, but your kids can actually tell you what's going on in life. I mean, it's cool. I uh, I was at the um, park one day because my oldest was playing flag football, and my youngest, well, she had to play. There was nothing else for her to do. So I got her on the playground, and I got a cell phone call, and, you know, well, they hung up right away, but I noticed, I, I can see bodies far away, you know, just not the particulars, and they were talking, and I love listening to kids, because you find out so much information. And um, so I still got my phone up, and, you know, you're thinking I'm on the phone, and I got my sunglasses on, so you don't know if I'm looking at it or not, and I'm hearing them, and um, why is your dad in a chair? I don't know, you know, it, it's fine, it's no big deal, and then I'm, you know, just sitting there with my phone, and my dad's blind too, well, and then you see this little person come around, and I mean, get this far from me, and I'm acting like I'm on the phone, you know, because I heard he's blind comment. And, I mean, she goes just like this, right in front of your kid. <laughs> and you're like, just a minute, please. Can I help you? Yeah. She said you were blind. So, you know, she lied to me or something. I said, no, I am blind. And then you explain there's different variabilities of it, you know. And, uh... Um, and then I found out from my oldest one when we were in the art class that um, she was nine at the time. So, I mean, you got like, what, well, from the age five to nine she was in school. And I never knew she got picked on. Um, and kids are brutal. I mean, you know, you're going to get what Courtney's dad has if he touches you. You're not going to be able to see good if he stares at you. Well, that's a lot for a kid, mm -hmm. you know. But you find this out, you know, and then you got to work with your kid. I mean, your kid don't have all the answers, but they come up with some good ones. That makes sense, too. So...